Hey, we're gonna... Oh wait, we're gonna film a video on how Al met Andy Warhol. Uh. Hey, How's that look? you're gonna sit there? Yeah, why not? Okay. What do you think? Hey. Hey, YouTubers. Ah, uh, seltzer. So, first off, I want to thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I want to thank John for shooting it and doing such a great job. Because it's a team effort. Everything is collaboration, not everything is just me, the boss, the star. I'm the one. Me, me, me. I, I, I. And that was Andy Warhol's whole thing that he realized that the most powerful way to create things was um, collectively. And he had his uh, studio down on Union Square on 16th Street, and it was called The Factory. And um, he let people just come in and, and uh, work there. Uh, it got his juices going. Earlier, he said casually, since I don't believe in painting anymore. Uh, Why? Well, I, I don't believe in painting because I hate objects, and uh, uh, I, I hate to go to museums and see pictures of the world because they look so important and they don't really mean anything. I think. People think of you as the, uh, the, the perfect pop artist without really knowing what that means, or I think really knowing what your work is about. I'd like to try to talk some more about the paintings and the things you did earlier, uh, because there's something that I think needs to be explained for the public, which has at this point a certain impression of you, and I'm not sure that it's the one that you would want them to have, although I don't think it matters to you very much. Is that true? What? D does it matter to you that people feel one way or another to you? I mean, you have a kind of reputation now, which is a little bit apart from, from what you really are, I think. And does it matter to you that this is so, that they feel one way rather than another about you? Uh, oh, I, I don't really understand. What, what, what do you mean? Uh, this is like sitting um, uh, at the World's Fair and you're riding one of those Ford machines where the voices behind you, it's so exciting. So the first time I met Andy Warhol, it was probably 1968, 69, and I was living on 9th and B, and Allen Ginsberg was my upstairs roommate, and we, every Friday, would have these potluck dinners, and he, in his apartment, had an amazing kitchen, you know, garland stove, stainless steel, everything, uh, and it was a real commercial kitchen, because that's what fed the nuns, that where we lived, the apartment building we lived in had been a nunnery. And my apartment, which was on the subground floor, had a beautiful garden out my door. And you could only get to it from my apartment. And so that's why we became uh, semi uh, roommates there. So we'd have, especially in the spring, summer, fall months, when that garden was beautiful and warm, had a big wall, and um, privacy, and upstairs was amazing, and so we had these great parties, and all the intelligentsia avant-garde artists um, were there, and in the 60s, there was like the rich people art and everybody else, and in the 60s, and, and the 60s was a was an interesting thing because... Who was Andy Warhol? Was he the rich people art or the... Or the no, Andy Warhol, the, the beauty of Andy Warhol was he that... He didn't fit... Either way. He, he was right in the middle of everything. And, you know, he's the guy who coined the phrase uh, 15 minutes of fame, and instead of shooting his wad all at once, he spent it one second at a time. So he really elongated his 15 minutes to a big, long time. 
and um, he was always there, but he was um, not there. But he he must have been so big. He was he he thought he was like his art would go out into the universe. Well, see, that was his thing. He's, and if for that 15 minutes, if one moment was a huge art show that made millions of dollars. He, he understood, because he had worked in industrial art, he had worked in commercial art, he had worked in advertising. Other people had kind of used those motifs, but he was the first one to really use them. And so, he, his personal self, I don't want to say he was a shy person, because he wasn't, but he wasn't gregarious. He was always there. He was like wallpaper. You know, he was always there, but he wasn't, um, you know, screaming or swinging on the chandelier, you know? Yeah. He was always there, and he, he wore a uniform. He had his white hair with bangs, relatively long, almost... Um, a quasi Beatles haircut, and uh, he would wear very simple kind of clothes, you know, monochromatic almost. Nothing really, nothing like this, nothing colorful, nothing splashy. And um, even when he went to his factory, so I met him at our Friday potluck dinners, talked to him. He was, you know, in that room, he was relatively accessible. He didn't really engage, but he was accessible. Um, I went to visit his factory a number of times. And then when I wasn't in the midst of that scene, because see, one of my, you know, blessings and, and also, you know, tedious things is my life is um, never you know people like Andy Warhol he did what he did his whole friggin life he never took any me because I was in prep school because I had a scholarly path I would be in this scene being an electrician artist avant-garde guy in involved in social activism but then I'd go away to school so I would be involved with that six, seven months, then bingo away at school six or seven months, you know, and, and my whole life has been that. I mean, it's never really, even when I was a scholar pretty steadily, I worked for people, so I never stayed at an institution, a university, um, for a long period of time. I would be working on a project, and then it would get done, and I would go off to some other place. And I liked that. I liked the diversity of it. I liked the um, almost anonymity of it. Because, like New York City, one of the great things about New York City, it was so big, but it was made up of all these little neighborhoods. Every three or four blocks. You know, there wasn't just one Little Italy. There were about 40 of them. You know, there was a Little Italy over on the Lower East Side between Houston and Canal. And there was a... Little Italy on the west side, um, you know, between Canal you know, and Houston, but between 8th Avenue and uh, West Broadway. And it, it, it went above, along Spring Street to Mott. So, but there were, but it was, its major thing was Mulberry. So there were all these little three or four block, like little towns. And they were right on top of each other. And I, you know, people used to call in New York City, like the melting pot, but it wasn't. It was a salad bowl. All these diverse flavors on top of each other, right next to each other, and living with each other and making each other better. So, um, um, I would pop in and out of all these different things going on, but I never, never was, you know, um, there all the time. And like, um, Samo, you know, uh, Gasquat. I knew that guy when he was a youngster. If you ever see his movie, the opening scene is, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Duval, uh, oh. Robert Duvall? 
Mm-hmm. No, 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 close though. He's he was a guy who played Jesus in The Last Temptation. Anyway, that guy's playing me, meaning mm. that guy's up there installing a piece of track light, mm. and um, Samo's down on the ground uh, with his cards uh, drawing away, and we're at OK Harris installing some track for for uh, OK Harris, and um, Andy walks in with. Um, that's when you first met Andy? No, no, no. I met him many, many times over and over again. And I was his electrician oh years before. I mean, when when that happened, um I was in my twenties, but uh, when I was the you know, the young dude electrician avant garde guy, I was like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Um, and I met Andy a number of times because uh, one time I was working uh, for my boss and we were working on something and there was an electric supply place right at the top of Union Square, um, like maybe on 17th or 18th, maybe 19th Street, right at the top part. And I was in there and this guy comes in and goes, oh, oh, is your electrician here? And I, and the guy who owned that supply store looked at me and I shrugged and he goes, this kid, he, he's a good electrician. So I went back with this guy and we went back, as soon as we walked towards uh, Andy's um, factory, I knew where, what, where we were going, and we'd go in there, and Andy had plugged all kinds of big lights, and he fried, uh, you know, a number of circuits, you know, because he was, he was... He did it himself? Yeah, well, who, all the people who, he had an entourage that you wouldn't believe in the factory, and there were tons of people, and he was making movies, and he was doing silkscreen, and he was doing all kinds of things all at once, because he it was a factory, you know? And he, you know, all the lights went out. Cool. So I said, okay, I can fix this. So, you know, I said, give me a few dollars, I'll go get some materials, and put in a new circuit breaker panel, because it was back from the old days. And, um, you know, I got him up and running, and he looked at me, he goes, oh, I know you, you're Alan's friend. I said, yep. And they said, oh... Yeah, he told me you were an electrician. I go, yep. So he said, you know, you should, you, he also said you were an artist and you're a filmmaker and you're a photographer and, you know, you should hang out here. And I said, sure, that sounds cool. So I did. And, um, you know, for a number of weeks I hung out there. But it was interesting, but it, you know, wasn't doing anything. I mean, Andy. He didn't had, give you any money? Yeah, sure, he'd give you money, he'd give you food, he'd give you whatever you wanted, really. And, um, you know, not in exorbitant amounts. But he was always looking for people he could use. And it, it kind of went to this thing that I'm looking at now. And that is, humanity, the individual person, if they aren't serving something higher than themselves, they're always getting in relationships of um, codependency, enabling, and using. And like you use somebody, and it always gets you in trouble. You know, oh, you know, it's like relationships, guys and girls. They get together, um, the guy goes, wow, she's really hot. The girl goes, well, he's got a house and he's got a job and, you know, he can take care of me. And then, she starts to um, get tired of him throwing his clothes on the floor and leaving the toilet seat up and just keeping all the dishes in the sink without cleaning them, even when he makes something just for himself and not for them both. And he gets tired that she doesn't, uh, you know, shave her armpits and uh, her pubes are not the right shape and uh, um, she got a little too much cellulite. (laughs) And uh, she doesn't look like she's 19 anymore. And, and those are relationships of using. Meaning you, you ex- have, oh, I can, you know, I'll put up with this for so much because I can get that. And that's not the basis of a relationship. And that was kind of what Andy did. You know, yeah, he, he gave people money. He took care of things. He, he gave people a, a opportunity when Basquat bounced into that place with Andy. I mean, man, they were like tight. And Andy, you know, Samo would have never been Samo without Andy. Andy 
connect to them, put them in the right places. Now, Sam, you know, Basquat was truly an amazing artist because that kid, when I met him, he, his parents, <laughs> his story is unbelievable. His parents went to Haiti and went, you know, up in the mountains and found him and said, oh, isn't he cute, like a dog? And they paid the lady some money and took him home and raised him as their little kid. But they were like white people as you could get with money. And, you know, they brought him up. And once he became a teenager and he started to realize who and what he was, oh man, that was too much. They drove him to like 136th Street, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard and just gave him $10 and let him out the door. <laughs> and he was like, you know, doing the best he could to survive. That's when I met him. I said, kid, well, what are you doing here? You know, this, you know, you know, I had gone to prep school. I know what a prep school uniform looked like. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you need a place. So, you know, that's what I did. I, I would find interesting people and um, give them an opportunity to become an electrician because an electrician is the best trade. Everyone needs one. Everyone's scared of electricity. And I mean, that's what happened to me. You know, when I was nine, I started being an electrician and, and it, it definitely was a major part of my life. And so I was trying to um, give him that scene and I had a, um, a loft downtown and, you know, I said, here, that corner's yours. And he stayed there for a while. Who's Jean Basquat? Yeah, Basquat, yeah. And uh, until... He's a, he's a famous artist. Yeah, yeah. Until... He'd paint refrigerators. Oh, yeah, mine. <laughs> you know? He painted every door in my loft. And I started painting refrigerators in around 2002. And I never knew he there was somebody else that ever did it. I just did right. it. Right. Well, he did it. and uh, Here's someone... I'll show you some of my art right here. And... Um, so, uh, but he had a, you know, he we'll show had, so we can show some of his refrigerators right here. Well, okay, good. But uh, he had a soul of an artist that he couldn't stop. Like we went into this one loft that, you know, I was demoing it out mm -hmm. to, you know, turn it into like a lawyer's loft because when we went, you know, the artist crew that was in Soho back in the sixties, you know, we got hassled by the... I mean, we weren't stealing anything. We weren't, you know, uh, squatting. We were paying rent in the electric bill. And still we got hassled for being did there. Did ba Boss Squat squat? No. Well, <laughs> I don't know what he did once he left me. But he basically hooked up with Andy Warhol and became but famous. Very was quickly. Andy Warhol attracted to him? He was a brilliant artist. I, I don't mean to make such a shallow I have no idea joke. what their, their you know, personal relationship, but when I saw them, they were tight. Meaning mm -hmm. I knew Andy Warhol, but I wasn't you, tight with him. You said that Andy Warhol was a very good person, especially compared to, even like you said, he was more of a nice person and understood the ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. Then people and like... And didn't uh, try to be just a number one. Right. You know, Klaus Oldenburg, I worked for him, and uh, Dali, I worked for him. And those guys, I mean, they were okay too, but they were so into themselves, it was mind-boggling. Hmm. Where Andy Warhol, you know, like I said, he was, res you know, reserved. He didn't jump right in. But he this was... This is amazing, by the way, he that, was an ob that you know all this stuff. He was an observer. I, you could see him watching people doing things. Where these other guys, it was all about their id. Well, John, I grew up in New York City, you know, between... Uh, you know, I was out in the city, you know, from... And you were a cool person, well, and no, you were cool social. Part. I was, I was You me. were social. Right. You but, went out and, and saw people every day. And you if I if day. I had any gift, it was to be in the right place at the right time. My life constantly has been that way. And um, so much so that I've, you know, learned not to worry, not to pressure, not to push, to just let the universe put me in the mix, and when my, it's like uh, going for the uh, brass ring and the merry-go-round, but at your time, instead of going, oh, you go for it, you grab it, you get it. And uh, then you share it, and you use it uh, in the service of the better. And Andy Warhol, and he never quite expressed it like I am expressing it right now, but 
he actually did do that. And you know, Dolly actually kind of did do that because he, you know, the, what I did for Dolly, again, I, I did some electric work, we talked, I showed him the, so I had a number of art galleries in New York City, um, or it was part. See, I never want to be that guy out front, you know. If I have to get up on stage and grab the microphone because no one else will, and it needs to be done, I, I can do it. But I don't. I like being in the background. I like helping, putting people there and having them be real successful because then I'm, you know, more than their entourage, I was the guy who helped them find that spot. Mm. And they know that. And they reciprocate and, and, and realize um, that it's like the guy who owned O.K. Harris. Well, again, I wish I knew his name. You know, and Ivan Karp owned O.K. Harris. And he had me, he wanted me to start another gallery that would be the lower, it's like baseball, you know, have the, the upper echelon and the lower echelon baseball. And so I was looking for a place and I stumbled across these two people, Phil and Jane Bear. And they both were Midwestern kids uh, of Methodist ministers and they didn't know each other when they were kids, but they both went off to um, Cal Arts to be artists, and um, they were involved in the 60s political movement, and they were part of the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. And so they were the biggest hippies, you know, they were part of um, the People's Park in the hate, and um, so they were truly amazing folks. And so um, I'm walking down West Broadway, and right at the corner of West Broadway and Broom Street is this big space, big commercial space. And there's a big sign on it saying, for rent, 5,000 square feet. I go, wow, oh, okay. So I walk in there, and there's Phil and Jane. And there, I look at them, they look at me, and we almost say in one word, you know, we want to start an art gallery. But they had just signed a lease. And they got the whole 5,000 square foot for uh, 400 bucks a month. Wow. And yeah, and utilities. What, what year? Oh, that was 70, early 70s, before I went to, to oh, okay. uh, it might even been 70 or 69, but no later than 71. So, um, um, I, I, you know, hooked up with them and it was a beautiful space because this building was built back in the day. There were a lot of beautiful buildings in especially lower Manhattan where there were big spaces between the buildings. You know, the building was on one street here and the other there. They weren't right up against each other. They had gigantic spaces because they didn't have air conditioning. So they had big windows and lots of light coming in. And in front of this art gallery, uh, the whole sidewalk was cast iron with glass in it because they had vaults in the basement and sunlight would come through uh, the sidewalk. And um, so we got the basement and this first floor is 5,000 square foot and the basement was great. It was like being in, in France because it had these vaulted ceilings that were bricked and the sunlight was coming in. It was just gorgeous. So um, the... Uh, I might have even been 71, 72, but anyway, early 70s. So we start this thing called the Una Bear Gallery, and we have lots of shows, and we bring lots of artists in, and Ivan, who was just up the street, could saunter down and um, take a look at what's going on. He could have his pick of the artist. And uh, Ivan was giving me money to pay for whatever needed to be paid for at that gallery and especially at the openings he would send booze and his caterer so we used to have really great um openings with you know chocolate covered strawberries and all kinds of fruit plates and meat and cheese and it was you know the great throwdown and you know um jane and phil bear 
mean, they knew the story, you know, I introduced them. And um, again, because I was never always there continually, they picked up what, what I started to do for Ivan, right? To be their, uh, you know, and Phil and Jane were amazing because Phil and Jane, so you have to realize that Broom Street was the street that brought the traffic from the Williamsburg Bridge to the Holland Tunnel. And so it was a non-stop uh, trickle, not trickle, but slow-moving torrent of traffic down Broom Street. It wasn't like a dead street. It was a really, you know, trucks and cars and everybody going to New Jersey through that tunnel went down Broom Street coming off the Waynesburg Bridge and off the Battery and off um, the East Side Highway if they didn't go all the way around. They could get on the tunnel going all the way around. But anyway, um, so they had a big window that was above the sidewalk, you know, by about five feet, meaning you'd have to bring a box to look in that window. And they built a little room in that window and they stayed there for a month and they ate and they shat and they had sex in the window. So the only people who could see Everybody them... Everybody could see it? Everyone mm -hmm. could see them, but the only people who could see them were the truck drivers because their trucks were elevated. <laughs> Did they film it? Yes, they filmed it. Was it live? Uh, no, but, you know, this is in this, no. But it was on video. There was a place called Captain Louie's and he was one of the nephews or sons of the uh, Sony fortune. And he came to New York and he would bring the Sony technology. And he had a studio downtown in Tribeca. And if you were a, a, like a, a, when we did uh, Potato Wolf, yeah. he was part of our crew, you know? And so uh, Phil, and that's how I met Captain Louie, was through Phil. Phil borrowed a, uh, and this is when videotape was reel to reel, yeah. You know, and it was three quarter, and you know the, the recorder was like gigantic and weighed a ton, and the camera anyway. So yes, they videotaped everything, and um, they were just ama and we just constantly had an amazingly good time. So the first few years, all of that was going on, and again, that's when I. Met Samo. I had another, I had a loft on Worcester Street, and I had what I called a dumpster restaurant on, um, oh, what was the name of that street? Mulberry. And, but further down, on the other side, you know, go, going towards Canal, towards where this little triangle where West Broadway was here, and Mulberry ran into it, and another street went that way. And anyway, so, um, I um, had a loft, was uh, playing with Phil and Jane at the law, at the gallery, and had this kind of off-book restaurant because there was no place to eat down there. You either went to Chinatown or a Dave's Corner on Canal, where those people were extraterrestrial. Dave was in this little glass box and he ate the cigars. He never smoked them. He just chewed on them and they kind of disappeared. And he just counted the money. And the waitresses were straight out of 1950 with beehive hairdos. And it looked like they were doing acid all the time. They were like on another plane of existence. And they had egg creams. Dave's Corner was famous for his egg creams and his hot dogs. And, you know, that was the closest food there was. And there was Little Italy over here, Chinatown over there. And we were on the west side, you know, the closest uh, food was you had to go up to the West Village, you know, so you were a good 10 blocks in any direction. And that's why I started this um, dumpster restaurant. And um, it was more like, you know, a communal place because lots of people would just go in there and cook. It had been, oh, a speakeasy, you know, kind of place. And there was the Pepsi Diner, which the guys from Saturday Night Live did their, their take off of Pepsi, Pepsi, Pepsi. No Coke, no Coke. And then one day they switched to Coke. No Pepsi. Anyway, so um, 
the thing about being in New York, all this stuff was right there. You could, you know, John Bellucci was my neighbor. Down, you know, Allen Ginsberg was my roommate. I mean, they, everybody was there. And if you weren't scared or nervous, if you were just, sure, hey, how you doing? You were part of the scene. And, and, and you mentioned John Belushi. Yeah. You said that John Belushi would get a little heavier. He had a, Then all of a sudden, you yeah, wouldn't see him for a few days or a day. he'd be like uh, he'd 40 come out, pounds lighter. And he was yeah, amazing. he'd be skinny. He would come out. He, one day, he'd be, you know, he looked like a Bowery bum, you know, not shaven. Your clothes have, you know, kind of like Bowery me. Bowery bum. Yeah, but kind of like me. And, um... And he, uh... Then the next day he'd come out with a nice suit. Oh, and yeah, Armani suit. Really looking good. You know, you know, great haircut. Because he was haircut. on drugs all night. Well, I can't Maybe. say that. I don't Maybe. know. But uh, there's a, a very little... It's common knowledge. So yes, guess who it's knows right. what he was doing. But I, I was... He had a walk on Dwayne Street. He was an amazing artist despite his drugs, obviously. And um, I, you know, it's, you know, he lived across the street, you know. I'd, you know, be walking to work. And That's amazing. But that's what New York was then. And just getting out there and being social around them, you met all of them. Yes, and inter not only met them, but it was part of the scene. Like, uh, they, another one of our dumpster, or what we would call our zombie clubs, because we did all these clubs where you would go in, we'd either do it in abandoned buildings, or we would find a funked out building that you could rent like a... Uh, the Bears rented that beautiful 5,000 square foot uh, space right on West Broadway for 400 bucks for five years. And then the next, after, you know, five years later, when they came to, you know, go for the rent, the rent went from 400 bucks to 12,000 a month. <laughs> and Whoa. of course they couldn't pay that. That's rich. Yes. Some so, rich person had to pay. So uh, the people. Rent it. Yes. And what happened was some rich people bought the building. And then as soon as the leases were out, they would tell everyone, okay, you used to pay $300. Now it's, it's 11 grand. Get out. And what happened was uh, we had this space that kind of made the cachet for their building. And I'm a master electrician, so I said, listen, you're like, and they kept having electric fires because the thing had been wired like in 1911. And I said, I'll make you a deal. We will pay $1,000 a month and I will rewire your whole building. You pay for the materials, I'll do all the work. And they will have, you know, the gallery will, will have the lease for another 10 years. By then, you know, we'll all go someplace else. So we made that deal for that space. And Jane, so they conceived Una, their first daughter, um, in that window, right? Wow. And uh, when Jane had that baby, it was the 4th of July. And Jane was as big as a house, and she'd be sitting in who her... Who conceived? Who, Jane and who? Jane and Phil Bear. Who's Phil Bear? They had the Una Bear Gallery. Okay, but what about Andy Warhol? Well, they were friends. I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. This was all a community. There was the, the kitchen, you know, and um, that grew. I mean, people would go to these things that we did and other people did, and out of that, they got ideas. And, like, you know, so Andy Warhol was one of the first guys who had a gigantic space, was making his art. He was doing it as a factory. That's why he didn't get, you know, hassled because... He was running a business, you know. He was running it like a fa it was a factory building, and um, so you know. Was that his cover? Not his cover. That's so how he did in, it. That's, so he could fit in with everybody. Right. That's how he did it. I mean, that was his vision to to <laughs> manufacture this art <laughs> and have the art aesthetic be about manufactured things like Campbell's yeah. soup, you know. And he loved Campbell's soup. Well, Andy Warhol he, did. Well, I don't know if he loved. This. That's what they say. No, because he I, ate it since he since the 1920s well, and 30s. Well, I never saw him eat any, so I don't know whether he really loved it. But uh, he really what he. That's did. what that's what people say well, about. You know what else they say? No, what did they? He say? had a nose job when he was 29. He could have. I have no idea because he liked aesthetics. Yes, he liked looking perfect, but he his did? perfect. Yeah, he did. I, I could tell, obviously, but I mean, that's cool. But that wasn't every... That's know, how a lot of people are perfect, in L.A. But his perfect 
wasn't the status quo perfect. You know, you're always like working out and wanting to get cut and you complain that you can't get to that perfect place. Well, he picked his perfect that he didn't have to work that hard. Meaning, yeah, he might have gotten... He you know, would he just not eat food and then he put a bunch of makeup no, and no, Yeah, well, and that's what I mean. He didn't care. I mean, he wasn't... You know, he was fat. an originator. Yes. He was. There's nothing like him in the world. You got People it. People are still influenced by him. Yep. His so, amazing silver hair that yeah, he came yeah, up with. Yeah, exactly. I, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I wanted silver hair. And I didn't know why. I had no idea that Andy Warhol had it. I just wanted it. Then I met a girlfriend in 2015, many years later, and she wanted silver hair too. Well, it, a lot it of was that like silver the, hair was wigs. Every... was wigs. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why, I mean, he would go out and look a certain way all the time. And it wasn't like all, every movie, time he went movie out. star gorgeous or honor sports. It was sports. just original. Oh, that's it, cool. It was himself. It was he didn't have abs and ripped no, like, no. like a leading he man. He was himself. He 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 defined what he wanted to be and he was cool. it. Period. But that's because he knew what he wanted and he knew what he was and he knew how, what the kind of life he was going to have. And kind of what happened was so he had this life and he was the head of the curve. And like I said, instead of spending his 15 minutes all in one shot, he did it one second at a time. And so that, his head of the curve, um, was, um, went on for years, especially in New York. And so all these parties, all these things, all these happenings, all these events that all different groups were putting on, if Andy showed up, you know, Andy got a million, I remember being at his factory, and he, he had this one lady take care of his mail, and he had... A gazillion invitations and he would just go to one or two or three a week and if whichever one he went his presence made it the thing you know what I mean I mean lots of people invited I mean, he had an invitation to everything he didn't go to everything but um, so he was a guy who knew what he was then he kind of changed it a bit to be what he wanted to be and that's what he put forth and he didn't settle for what was being put forth by Madison Avenue or Hollywood he was Andy Warhol and that's an original right he an original you know there are very few originals and um but part of that was Regardless of whether or not he had a totally amazing hair hair cut and outfit and everything, and besides that, his facial appearance, no matter what clothes he was wearing, was like really it, it was it was the a, same every time. It was kind of in the top aesthetic for as far as someone could look. No, it wasn't. It was just the Andy. I mean, no one else looked like Andy Warhol. Period. There were no other people. There wasn't like, you know, the but Andy you're Warhol there's look at Kmart, you know. More it, more emphasis, put more emphasis on originality rather than just no, not standardization he, but, no. of well, yes, being an excellent physical health On the surface, that's what it stuff. was, but he put more focus on being himself within the construct of how he constructed what he wanted to be. Meaning, there was the Andy Warhol that he was when he was a kid in the Midwest, uh, the Andy Warhol, what he was when he went to art school, the Andy Warhol, that when he worked in industrial art and advertising, that's when he decided, I'm going to create, just like I create an advertising uh, image, I'm going to create my image. And he may have gotten plastic surgery. I never yeah. really, he never he said did. that. But, or told me, or, and like we weren't buds, but, you know, I knew him. I, I had free, I could, but he, I could walk in and out he of his walk place, in not a factory, problem. and he knew right, it, right. It, it was cool because like, I was part like, of that scene. Yeah, until he got shot, Ugh. and when he got shot, that's when everything changed. Wow, that's terrible. So he got shot, and I think he got shot in his gallbladder. And oh, that's how he died. No, he didn't die. They, eventually, he, eventually. They tried, he got surgery when he was fifty-eight, and, and 
something to do with his gallbladder. Right, because he got shot there. But he lasted another 20 or 30 years after he got shot. So, you know, yes. You know, at the end of the day, that was a contributing thing. But it wasn't like he was murdered by this mm. woman. But this woman was, you know, really off the wall. And the thing about the factory, there were loads of people in there that were off the wall. And virtually everybody was. That's why I wasn't, you know, I would go in every now and then, especially if he called me up and I had something to do for him. But letting those strangers in is yes. kind of like what happened to John Lennon. No. He did it to one person, but it was different from the factory, obviously. No, John Lennon, that, that, he was assassinated, John Lennon. But it was that guy who was obsessed and kept going over to his house. But the thing was, um, the police ne- let it happen. Meaning, Alan Town and Bound. Did you ever meet John, John Lennon? Lennon? Sure, yeah, yeah. You met John Lennon? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I used to live up <laughs> near, um, he lived in the Dakota, up on the west side, right? Up near Lincoln Center. And um, I had a girlfriend who had an apartment. Not in the Dakota. It was no, it wasn't. It was in another building, but it was part of their neighborhood. And there was this place. And it's not around anymore, but there used to be pharmacies. Shreyas was a pharmacy that had a um, like a uh, you know a counter where you get breakfast and a cheeseburger and a milkshake and an ice cream soda and and. Um, uh, the, the guys and gals who worked in that neighborhood yeah, yeah. Um, would have breakfast there. Okay. And I would go in there and have breakfast, especially if we were working up on the west side. And I'd go have breakfast. I'm a breakfast guy. And I'd read my New York Times and Wall Street Journal and wait for my crew, and they'd meet me there, and we'd go oh. on to our job. And my timing, there was a 10-year period when John Lennon was in a Beatle wasn't, I mean, you know, he was always a musician, but he was outside of, he had a, a son, and he wanted to raise that boy. He wanted to be there every minute of that boy's life. And um, so he, uh, he kind of unplugged from the music scene. He had more than enough money, you know, uh, the powers that be told him to, you know, shut up and just enjoy his money, which he did. And then, um, basically, Ronald Reagan became president, and the politics changed even weirder. So he had written a ton of songs, and um, the fantasy, he brought out the fantasy album, and uh, he was going to bring out three more albums. Yeah. And basically, he was assassinated for that. And oh, for trying to get even bigger or work. Well, well, to bring. His, to, speak his voice even right, more. Right, speak his voice, yes. Because, uh-huh. you know, uh, what's his name? Paul, That's what you think? Yeah, Paul McCartney. I'm he, not going to comment. He was allowed to be, you know, he had wings and he did, you know, silly little love songs. He wrote a song called Silly Little Love Songs. But John <laughs> Lennon, you know, was writing about the human condition and uh, how it needed to change. And. Um, so, uh, you know, so, what ha- so I had a friend, Alan Tannenbaum, and he was the photo editor of uh, the um, Village Voice, and then the Soho News. And uh, he was shooting John and Yoko. Um, he was a, a good friend of theirs and a good friend of Annie Leibovitz. And he was shooting John, and he just happened to be there the day... John Lennon, he, you know, he was going to spend the whole day, you know, got there in the morning, shot some for breakfast, um, you know, they went down and um, Chapman was waiting there, right? And he was just like, huh, huh, in a corner. And there was always, there were a lot of rich people who lived in the Dakota, so there were always policemen there. Uh, why? Because the way you went into the Dakota, they had a place where you drove in and you could, you know, a car or a limo or a cab could come in and drop you off. You weren't right on the street. And this guy was inside that circle and uh, Lennon said to one of the cops, hey, get rid of the guy. He's, he's weird. Anyway, so um, he came back later that afternoon, around five o'clock, coming from the studio, 
and Chapman's still there. And, um, you know, um, Chapman comes up, oh, can I have your, I love you, can I have your uh, autograph? And uh, John says, hey, I get rid of this guy, sure. So he, he's doing the autograph, and a guy pulls out a twenty two, like, <coughs> shoots him, right? Well, the bullet went what they call through and through. Really didn't hit anything, but he was bleeding, right? And so, um, you know, he looks at this, and then, like that, the cops were there and took Chapman away. Another car came and put John in what is known as a... Um, Instead of a gurney this way, it's like a chair. And they put him in there, and he bled to death in the police car. Meaning he was conscious and go, hey, I'm going to walk to the hospital. You know, I'll go get a cab. And they wouldn't let him out. He, he bled to death in, in the police car. Mm -hmm. And the policemen who were there were never able to be found. Now, this is what is called an urban legend, meaning I was not there. Alan got his cameras and his film taken away and scurried away and wasn't there for the last moments. So what really happened, I'm not sure, but that's what I heard from people who were there, right? Not me, I wasn't there. And that never got really publicized, never really got very similar to Princess Diana, meaning, you know, she had the car crash in Paris right above uh, this um, statue to, uh, you know, the Illuminati. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was like, what? <laughs> and, and when the French uh, ambulance guys got there, they could have just whooshed her away to the emergency room, but they didn't. They said, oh, we want to stabilize her. And she was there a good 40 minutes, and she too bled out. Mm. So... These things are... They, um, keep her the, the, they keep them there so they die. Yeah, and, and can say, oh, it was the accident. But somebody's doing it, but you don't want to blame the U.S. government. Oh, no, no. And, and kids, there is no U.S. government. It's factions of all these different... When you hear the Political term... Groups. Yeah, when you hear the term deep state... Who are swayed or, by trends also. Right, right, it, it, exactly. So there is no, there is no they or them... Or there are factions that have sways and, and do They things. may be open to being liberal if they're Republican yeah, for three years. Yeah, of course, after realize years. liberal uh, or Republican or conservative, they're just liberal and conservative are just two wings of the same court. What we live is in a corporate plutocracy. You know, if you drive around America and you're out there's there no way, in there's the no back way to town, know who you see signs saying... Incorporated village. What does that mean? It means that village is a corporation. If you go to your county, you will find your county has been incorporated into a corporation. When you look at your state, I was in Florida in 08 when the crash happened, right? The real estate? Excuse me? Real estate? No, I was taking care 08. of me. 08. I was taking estate. care of my parents in Florida. They were dying, so I was taking care of them. And oh, I, I kind of, well, everyone dies. You know, as Buddha says, if you're not ready to die, you're not ready to live. But anyway, you know, someone had to take care of them, so I did. So, um, um, and it's always a great thing to be part of, my brothers and sisters, eh, they, had to, they had their own thing going. Um, so I was the only guy who had the ability to be with my parents. And in 1980, when I came back from Ireland, I thought my parents, you know, they were in their 70s. I said, well, I'll hook back up with them and, and, and be part of their life, and, and they'll die soon. Well, they lived another 28 years. <laughs> I didn't expect them to live that long, but they did. So they were dying. Oh, hey, when the crash happened, I was in Florida, right? So the state of Florida, you know, went broke. But they had a trillion dollars in the piggy bank, right? In bonds, in Florida bonds. And um, they cut the budget for all of Florida education in half. So all the kids going to college, half of them couldn't go to college anymore. Half the co high school kids never finished high school. You know, everything that was being done for grammar, it was like unbelievable. It was like, 
And I remember I went to, there was the governor and state legislators came to um, talk at my neighborhood library. And I said, well, you know, I'm not doing anything. I'm going to go see the gov. And I went down and I talked to him. And I knew they had all of this money in the piggy bank. And when it came time for questions and answers, I said, you know, why don't you liquidate some of your, um, your bonds and your holdings? And he said, well, the stockholders of the state of Florida wouldn't like that. Stockholders, not the citizens. <laughs> Stockholders. Yeah. Yeah. So that's America, kids. We live in a corporate plutocracy. We don't have a government. Come on. How so, about John Lennon? Did you, when you actually met him, where did you? I was sitting in this coffee shop, you know, having breakfast. He walked in, he ordered things. And the first time I said, oh, and he totally so didn't look like John Lennon. He didn't look like a Beatle. He just looked like average guy, right? And I looked at him and I said, what's your name? And he goes, my name's John. And I said, oh, my name's Al. And we shook hands. And from that moment on, at least three or four times, for at least two years, I would have breakfast with John Lennon. All right, but not sitting across from him. Yeah, talking. right there, right there. He's, we're, we're at a counter, you know, those seats that move like this. Yeah. He's sitting right there. Hey, Al, can I look at your New York Times shirt, John, here? Three years. Two or Ooh. three times. Two or three times a week, I'd have breakfast with him. So you know, it was being in New York and... And being you know, at that counter and he walked in and had breakfast and... Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, my girlfriend I had there, she then did get an apartment in the Dakota and then I would see him in the Dakota. Yeah. And, you know, we, you know, he'd, hey, I'm going to have a little party. You want to come? Oh, sure. You know, so it was no big deal, you know? And then when we did Universal Peace Day and they were starting to build... Um, Strawberry Fills, we did it in the um, the uh, band shell, which is right across the way of the park. There's a big, you know, big field for the um, the band shell, and uh, you can stick 20,000 people in there easy. And on the edge of that that field is Strawberry Fields right over there. Cool. So I got to know uh, Yoko Ono by doing that. And I met her a couple times in the Dakota. But these aren't like my best friends. No, they're just, hey, how you doing? But that was New York. That was the beauty of New York, is that everybody was willing to get, hey, you know, and give you a minute or two if you were interesting, you know, and or be part of whatever you were doing if it was interesting. And that was the beauty of New York City. Everyone had space and time for each other. And what's interesting about New York, New York always changes but stays the same. And um, the uh, thing, I, I left New York in 1988, I went back in 2011, and I went to neighborhoods like in Bed-Stuy and, and Waynesburg and places that I had lived that if the, the crime and gangs in the 80s was so intense that if the people didn't know you, they'd virtually kill you, right? And I went back there and there was like, Latte bars and Jimmy Choo Choo stores and girls in, in high heels and, and, you know, it was like, I can't believe this. But Mr. Choo Choo Frito still had his, his bodega over there and the boys, the OGs were still over there and the gangsters were still over there. And it was like, everything changed, but still stayed the same. And that's New York. That's the beauty of New York. I, now, I haven't been back since 2011. I, I, but I still have tons of friends that I could go back and, and um, hang with them, you know? And, um, and that's the other amazing thing is my oldest friends are all those people in New York I knew in the 60s and 70s. The ones who aren't dead are still my buds, you know? And we get together. If they're driving up 81 past Roanoke, they'll call me up and say, hey, I'm driving through, let's have lunch, or can I stay at your house, or... You know, we're going to be at a hotel. Come on over. So, so you want to, so you want to talk more about Andy Warhol and your actual interactions with Andy Warhol. Well, again, here's a guy that I got to know pretty well. 
um, I introduced him, you know, um, the movie about Basquad, um, William Defoe, William Defoe plays me, the electrician. The opening yeah. scene is there, and, and Basquad is, he, so we, we were renovating a loft for um, these uh, lawyer guys, and um, it was just filled with stuff to the ceiling. And I had a friend who had an auction house. So I called her up and said, hey, I got a demo at this space. Why don't you come and, and take what you want out of it? Because she would take virtually everything. So he was with us. And there was, you know, boxes of, you know, shoes and hats and amazing plastic Bakelite jewelry, which turned out to be worth a lot of money. And... This, there was this whole corner of this loft that was full of paper, really nice paper, every different size and cut, and pastels and colors and pencils and pens. And Basquiat came over to me because, look, look at all this stuff. I said, sure, it's all yours. Take it away. You know, take whatever you want. Yeah. And so he did. And he took it back to his little place. He had a place on Rivington Street after he moved out of my place. But you weren't... You weren't a, in a homosexual relationship. No, no, no. I was his friend. I was trying to teach him how to be an electrician because he had no money. He had no way to make money. And being a, a tradesperson, you can make money. And he painted your refrigerator. Well, he painted, when he lived and I walked, he painted everything. One day I came back, I, I'd gone away on a trip. And when I came back, everything was fucking painted. I mean, every door, every... Everything. And did someone he wasn't sell famous. one of your refrigerators? I yes. When 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 Busquad died, and I still had access to all that stuff, because once he went off to Andy, he became pretty. You know, he actually became pretty famous pretty quick. Because he had, he was like Andy in that he had this focus, this nonstop. He's not stopping. He's just going. He's doing it. Working. And, mm. and, and, you know, nothing got in his way. Nothing de really depressed him. Nothing, you know, and I could relate to that because when I was a little kid, I had that same kind of, you know, if somebody tried to bully me, I didn't even realize I was being bullied. So I was boring to the bully so they would leave me alone. And, and that was him. He was so focused on his work. But once he... Got hooked up with Andy and within Ivan Karp's little world of selling everything. Like Ivan Karp once said to me when I was bending pipe and putting it on, he goes, you know, if you put that on a piece of plywood, I could sell that. I mean, Ivan Karp could sell anything. So he definitely sold. And this was right, you know, Basquad, that, that was, what year was that? Was in the seven, late, late 70s. How much did they sell the, your the refrigerator for that you left behind? I, I... You know, brought Ivan in there. It, it, I had it stuck in a a space I had, and I said, "What do you give me for all this?" He goes, "I'll give you twenty grand right now, cash." And I said, "Fine." I, God knows what he sold it for, but probably a lot more than twenty grand. Okay, and what about that's amazing? Yeah. Okay, and what about that's Andy, the art world? Andy Warhol. Do you have any? recollections of words that you spoke back and forth to each other or what was your perception of him as a kind or so, not kind know, human fact, being so you said he was kind again his scene you know i would see you know i met him when we had a potluck tennis right i met him when he nearly burned down his factory and i rewired everything and i was you know there doing that it took me a month or so to do that and i'd see him every, hey how you doing it okay you know He'd be reading something or I'd be in there because it was a place you could just go in and sit on a couch and read a magazine. You know? Was he your friend? I would say he was a good acquaintance, not a okay. friend. I don't know if he had any friends. You know, His I, mother. Meaning I don't, meaning no one Supposedly. got, at least I did not get that close. I mean, I got close enough to say, hey, how you doing? And we, we talked about aesthetics. We talked about art. We talked about social things. And he had an opinion but he didn't have a belief. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wait, I accidentally he, stopped recording. Okay. okay, he had an opinion, but he didn't have a belief? Right. And that you he, mean religiously? No, in, in meaning all he wanted to do was make art. 
and sell it and be the famous Andy Warhol. That's it. Now he, you know, like I said, I'd be working on something for him and, you know, I'd be hanging out or I'd meet him at a party, I'd, I'd be glad to, you know, I knew him enough to go talk to him where he, he wouldn't, because if people wanted to be around him because he was famous, he would be somewhat, I mean, that's what he wanted, but it made him uncomfortable. <laughs> it was like, yeah. it was, you know, it was, He had to do it whether he wanted to right, or not. Right, right, exactly. It was real work for him. But people that he had known, and I knew him, like I said, he was an acquaintance, a good acquaintance, enough, you know my name, I knew his name, you know, we had people that we knew in common, and we could talk about them, we could talk about art, you know, he was a big fan of the New York Post, and he would have comments on whatever was in the New York Post at the time, and um, the New York Post is an interesting newspaper, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, the Herald Tribune, all those were up upscale things, but mm. all of the uh, Daily News um, and uh, the Post and a few other papers like that, they were rags, but they had interesting, they had information in it that you couldn't find anyplace else, and, and he was pretty good at, at picking up on what that mm. was. Yeah. And so, uh, um, anyway. So that's, you know, like I said, I was a good acquaintance, not a friend, you know, because I don't really know, because I would see him, so when I did nightclubs, and, you know, part of my job was to make the rounds of those nightclubs and make sure nothing was exploding or, or blowing up or everything was working, because, you know, a nightclub is flashing lights and loud music. Mm. And if the lights aren't flashing, you know, people are like, hmm. So I would drop in on all of the places that I was the electrician for. <clears throat> and that was part of a social, you know, it was three years of my life that, you know, that was cool. I, Cause I loved to dance. I would kind of cruise in like John Travolta and uh, be the electrician, you know, I didn't have to wait on mine. I didn't even have to say anything. I would just like, hey, You're Bob, how like you doing? You're walking disco ball. Yeah, yeah that's Like when you move, there's all these lights Yeah, on I'm there. the walking disco ball. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I thought it I, looks cool. It looks I thought really I put, original. You know, I put this on yeah. for for telling this story. So there was about three years when I was doing that, and talk about sex. Everyone was having unbelievably, you know, it was called zip a zipless fuck, and um, you know, some you know I would take girls would take me what home. Years? I would take girls home. There was people who were having sex with five, six, ten different people a night. In the 60s or 70s or yeah, 80s? This was the uh, 70s. Hmm. And, and that was just before the, eight, the AIDS Oh, the AIDS thing around. was percolating in that. You know people. Because AIDS just, you know, you get it, you have it, you don't know you have it for years, and then you start to feel bad, they give you a test. But not literally. I don't get it because I'm very extraordinarily careful and the people out there that you're well, talking it's, it's to, you're just using it as The other side of the thing of AIDS... <laughs> AIDS <laughs> you're not telling them that you get it. <laughs> AIDS, <laughs> AIDS is actually very difficult to get because you have to basically swap... Um, blood. Yeah, blood. And so unless you're shooting needles or doing a sex act that caused something to bleed, uh, you're not going to yeah. get AIDS. Yeah, no. you're so, not going to, yeah, no. so it's good. So it's, um, you know... Extraordinarily unlikely. One in a thousand chance of getting but it, it was without so there loose. being blood. Uh, here's a good... I was... Uh, so I built nightclubs, restaurants, and fancy lofts for rich people between 19... When I came back from um, New Mexico, was, I guess, 73. So from 73 to 77, that's what I did. That's when that yeah. whole disco scene was going crazy and, and the art scene was going crazy and everybody was having a great time and doing loads of drugs. Luckily for me, I can't do drugs. My body, I can't even look at cocaine. I can't do anything. It, you know, it just, I get sick. You know, I get the uh, sniffles. I feel like crap, you know, and I can't drink. If I have more than three drinks in one night, I'll have a hangover for a week. What's the fun of that? You know, anyway. So I'd much rather be totally sober and have a good time. I love to dance. I love to talk to people. I love to have a good time. Maybe we should get rid of this out of the frame. 
Sure. Take that. It's old box. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after we filmed the whole interview with yeah. it. <laughs> so <laughs> <Was> it, uh, <laughs> and the commercial. It's a beer commercial. Right. Hey, we want to cut it back. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you studio, can't see the logo. Studio Fifty Four was was off the hook. I mean, down in the basement, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah down there. Anyway, and all the people who wrote about how terrible that kind of lifestyle were, were down there taking part of it. It's like, it was unbelievable. It was hypocrisy at its highest. And at a certain point, I just said, this is a waste of time. You know, I'm not going to do this. You know, so I got involved in other things. I, you know, I still did that work because it paid me real well. But I, I wasn't in the scene anymore. And that was, you know, kind of it. Do you remember anything in particular Andy Warhol said to you? Or was he a... He, did you say he was kind? Well, he wasn't Compared mean. Compared to Dolly. You know, Dolly was like, Dolly, it's all about me! Dolly, Dolly, Dolly! And Andy, he just kind of irradiated Andiness, You know? And so... He didn't have to be mean about right, it. Right. He didn't have to. No, he was quiet. He was, you know. You was know. Dolly like an Italian on a lot yeah. of coffee? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else. I mean, he was all about more. You yeah. know, more sex, more drugs, more alcohol, yeah. more, yeah. more, 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 more. Yeah. And, and, you know, pretty much all those guys in the 60s. Like a real, almost an animalistic, instinctual type of person. Oh, no, no, no. Um, he was in his head beyond belief. Um, was he like a beast? No, he was more like a cartoon character. Okay. Of of a a an Italian duke. He, he was he Italian? This, I think he's Spanish. Oh, okay. He had. We'll this, talk about him in the next one. He had a mustache you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah, I know. He stuck. He, he. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so anyway, um, and then. You know, I met Donna Ann, and we traveled the world for three, for four years. So I was out of New York. I was out of that loop. Mm. From 77 to 80, I was out of that loop. Mm. And, and see, that was the other thing. All those other years, I would go away and do something else. Like, between 73 and 77, I went to Ireland three different times and stayed there for two or three months, you know? I mean, I was never... People... I had a friend of mine... Here's a good story. Gary Blue. Mm -hmm. Gary Blue was a great painter. I mean, really mm -hmm. amazing. I mean, he was really super talented. He came from Wyoming. But this is a whole new story? A whole new story. But long okay. story short, we'll, t we'll tell the real deep story of Gary Blue at another time. Okay. But he was as good as any other artist I've ever known, and I've known a lot. But because he couldn't schmooze, because he didn't have a look like Andy Warhol did, or an attitude like Dolly had, yeah. or or any of those things, he would think he had to drink, and then he'd get drunk, and then he'd say really stupid things, and that's not really good for selling paintings. You know what I mean? And so he he kind of fell out of that loop, but he stayed in. He, he came from Wyoming, went to Cal Arts. He was a buddy of uh, uh, the Bears. He came from that scene of the Bears in California. And um, and he just stayed in this little apartment for 15 years painting. Did he create really brilliant, amazing things? Oh, amazing things? stuff. I mean, he, like but I said, he wasn't very social. Right. And then after he died, he got... He didn't, I don't know if he's died, died or not. What happened to... Yeah. That's a whole other story that'll take a long time, which I will Is he, tell. Was he an unknown? Yeah, well, he could have been. He was always three different times. He almost hit the big time, but when his big opening was... Um, he, you know, he, the rich person is going to spend 50 grand to buy a new artist painting. You have to lick their, their butt, you know, you mm. have to really be self-deprecating and he sure wasn't. He'd get drunk and be really, really, ooh, not nice. So mm. that doesn't go good with uh, selling paintings. Did Andy Warhol have to do that? No, because he developed his own aesthetic and Did nobody else had Did he have funding? It. Was his family rich? No, but he had worked and saved enough, and he he was like a, um, you know, it's a factory, meaning once he started turning that stuff out, he had it all down. 
He started as a graphic designer. Yeah, yeah. But so he made, uh, you know, he saved his money. He had a nice little, but he had it all worked out. He had it all figured out. He had it all planned on what he was going to do. He did? Yeah. yeah. And he always did. He, he, You know, that's the one thing I could tell you about Andy Warhol. He was never indecisive. He was never, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I don't know. What to, how am I going to pay the bill? He had it down. He had it down before he showed up to New York. So the sun is setting. The last few little bits of, of glinty light is left. Yeah. And but I will say au yeah. revoir, YouTube fans. And again, I want to thank you for uh, watching these. And anybody who wants to <clears throat> communicate to me, it's the dude awake 42 at Gmail. Okay, bye. And click here to like, uh, you know, click below the video to like it. Uh, click over here to see more of Al's videos. And click here to go to my page. So, I will, <clears throat> we'll do another video tomorrow yeah. when the sun comes up. Yeah. Okay, bye.